louder and a little bit closer. Thank you, Ralph. So we have a few friends that are still struggling in, but we'll kind of get the ball rolling nice and easy. It's Saturday morning. We just really are excited that you're here and probably more excited that it, this event is today and not two weeks ago during our record blizzard. So we just thank God for that, right? And the sun is shining. And I know that it's early and you feel a little tired, but it says something about you that you're here on a Saturday at 9 o'clock that you folks are hungry for knowledge and that you want to live your lives to the full. Either that or you're an early riser and you're just here for the coffee and snacks. But either way, you're going to be glad that you came. So I do want to thank all of our friends here at Messiah Church for just opening their doors and welcoming us. And I think, is that a, a Pastor Stephen thing? Hey, it's a pastor sighting. Welcome. Thank you for your hospitality and for hosting us here today. As sponsors of this seminar, on behalf of Prayer Ventures, we want to thank you, Glenn, for your passion, not only for God, but for people and helping us live our lives to the full. So thank you for coming. So just some housekeeping things, because you know we have to cover that. Uh, the restrooms, if you're not familiar, are just out this way and then to your right. So that's kind of the important detail. Around 10.30, 10.45, we'll take a break. You can stretch your legs, top off your coffee, visit, return phone calls, whatever you have to do there. Then after the break, we'll come in here, and I'll share a little bit about Preventures and what we do. And it's been our tradition to have an offering at that time. And while your registration offset the cost of the seminar, really the offering is supporting the programming, much like seminars like this, but I'll tell you more about programming too. So during the break, you can think about that and prepare for that. Then at that time, Glenn will round out the rest of our day with his awesome teachings. And then we will have a little bit of time at the end. We'll stick around if you have questions about Prayer Ventures or anything for Glenn. He's got a wonderful resource table there that's sort of watched over by his family. So even just going meeting his family there is great. But he's got some wonderful resources um, building relationships. So you want to take a peek at those. Has anyone read his books or have had a chance? So yeah, check around. They're awesome. And then this would be the point where you touch your cell phones, make sure that the ringer's off. And I think we can all agree even if the buzzer's off, because of whether your pocket buzzes, your purse buzzes, or what, it's just as distracting if it has one, like a meow ringer, whatever, right? So with all of those housekeeping things aside, I'm just so pleased to introduce this man. And many of you already know him, but if you don't, he's just an extraordinary individual, and I'm going to run down the reasons why. So he has been on an amazing and divine orchestrated journey with his career path, starting in engineering. Then he went through um, seminary and became an ordained uh, minister, back to school for his PhD in psychology, and now he has a thriving counseling practice. He's a sought after lecturer, teacher, radio speaker. He's a published author, and I like to say, uh, uh, butcher, baker, relationship maker, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I would like you to join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Glenn Pickering. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and thank you. And I'm just going to take a minute. Oh, so sorry, no. I, I, sure, sure. Okay. So I just want to open us with prayer for anointing on his teaching and for each of us as we are here. So if you join me in prayer. Lord Jesus, we just bring this morning to you and let what we learn and what we hear and what we sink into our hearts be glorified to you. I ask for your anointing on Glenn as he's had months of preparation. Father, just let those lessons come right through him. And Father, we just pray everyone here would just open our hearts and minds to what it is that you want us to know. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I'm going to do something I never do. I'm going to give you my one-minute commercial before I start because here's why. I always forget to do it. <laughs> I get all excited. I start teaching. People start interacting. Things happen, and I forget to do my commercial. <laughs> and I go home, and I think, oh, crap. So my one-minute commercial. I, um, I have a counseling practice in Eden Prairie. I've been doing that for quite some time. I'm in my day job. And um, uh, I talk with individuals and couples that I work with about a game that I call Tag, where... Um, I've really come to understand that all of the relationship troubles we get ourselves into come down to really playing some version of this game. 
Now, plain tag either means all the things I don't say or all the things I don't share because I don't want to get tagged, I don't want to be it, I don't want to be the bad one. Or then if I feel like I made a mistake or somebody's being harsh with me or critical or judgmental, then I want to tag them back or tag somebody else and blame somebody for my troubles. And uh, sometimes people ask me, well, Glenn, did you create that game? And I think, well, there's a very young couple who I know. One of them ate the apple, gave it to the other one. I felt ashamed. <laughs> then they were, so the, they did the first thing you do when you play tag, which is try and hide so nobody notices. So the young man tried to hide behind a tree, thinking God wouldn't find him. Now, I laugh every time I read that story. <laughs> the God of the entire known universe who created that universe with a thought is <laughs> not going to know that I'm behind that tree. <laughs> so he find, does find him, it turns out. And so that passive way of playing a game where nobody notices me is not going to work. So then we launch into the blame game. So God says to Adam, well, who told you to eat the apple? And he says, well, the woman that you gave me... <laughs> Right? So it could be her, God, or it could be you, but for sure it's not <laughs> me. So this is a very old game, I promise you. We've been literally playing this since the very beginning, and I understand how it wrecks relationships, and I teach people how to recognize the game and break out of it. Now, you have a distinct advantage because you're going to learn today how to get your mind transformed in a way that will make these books even more helpful and more powerful. So instead of having to learn a lot from the beginning before you can kind of start applying it, you're going to be able to just take the stuff in here and start applying it immediately. So... I strongly urge you to get one of these, or both of them, as a way to continue what you learned today if you find it helpful. And we have a special deal. The books are 15 bucks a piece. If you buy three of them, you get them for 30, so you get a free one. And here's how it come. In my practice, I know this. I work pretty fast with people. I tell people, you should be able to tell after you meet with me even just six or eight times that your life's already considerably better. If they're willing to read one of my books as we go along, it'll take them five or six sessions. If there's one other person in their life who's reading one of those books with them, going through it, reading it with them, learning along with them, and encouraging them, it's only going to take three or four. Because I just really get that even one person in their life who gets it, understands what we're working on, is trying to be on our team about that, we learn stuff so much faster. So you get three of them for 30, because I want you to give one of them to somebody else. Not as my marketing strategy, but because it will be helpful to you. All right, so that's enough of that. We'll talk more about that at break time. Okay, so let me jump in. I heard our pastor at our church the other day talk about the story of Doubting Thomas. And on Doubting Thomas gets a bad name. What's the one thing we know about him? He didn't believe. He was doubtful. But the pastor made this really powerful point. He said, you know, Doubting Thomas gets a bad name. Because the truth is, all he was saying is, I need to see Jesus' wounds, because that's what makes it all real. And we need to understand, it's actually really important that we claim our wounds, those places in us that are hurt. Two reasons. One, if I don't claim my wounds, I can never get better, because if I'm busy pretending I don't need help, I don't get help. That's why Jesus said, why do you see the speck in your brother's eye, you don't see the log in your own eye? Until I see the part of my life that I need to have be different, nothing ever changes. So, I need to understand that I've got to claim for my own self, if I'm ever going to get healed, that part of me that's hurt or broken or wounded. But we need to do that for the other people in our life, too, and here's how it comes. How many of you have ever gone to hear an inspirational speaker talk about a topic on a subject in which they have never themselves struggled? <laughs> right? We go to talks to hear someone who has a struggle that's kind of like ours, who's figured out a way to go through it, work hard, come out the other side, at least in some beginning way, and they teach us stuff about the struggle, they help inspire us to believe we can come out the other side, and they give us some strategies about how to do it, right? The only people who are actually helpful to us are people who have been wounded, and can claim that wound. And they can teach us what they've learned in that process. That's what makes them useful to us. So sometimes I used to wonder, you know, why Jesus didn't start his ministry until he was 30, but I think I understand that better now. How helpful is the advice of somebody who's never been through what I've been through? It's almost useless, right? But how helpful is the, the advice of someone who's really, really smart, who's really, really wise, who's been through stuff a lot like what I've been through, learned some stuff, started to come out the other side in a really powerful way, how helpful is that? <laughs> so we need to understand what makes Jesus helpful is that he's willing to go through what we have and it actually claim the woundedness that goes with that, which is part of why, see, Thomas gets sort of a bad name, because all he was saying is, if you haven't actually been hurt, your words don't mean anything to anybody. And that's powerfully true. Unless you've been hurt, your words don't mean anything to anybody. Now, here's the really great thing about all of you. 
You're coming here today ready to be um, healed in your own way, to be transformed, and I love that for you. But it's also important to know this. You are also here for other people, including some people you might not even know you're here for. Because even when I'm quite sure I know what God's doing with my life, I'm always wrong. In a way, it's always like, I think God's moving in this direction, and that's true. So it's not that I'm totally wrong. It's that then there are also other layers to it that are like, oh, there's so much more to that than I thought. So I promise you, all of you are here for reasons that you know and for reasons that you don't. And I applaud you for being willing to be here for both reasons. To claim your own woundedness, because it's going to be helpful to you, and because in claiming your woundedness, talking to people about this seminar, what you learned, it's going to be helpful to them too in a really powerful and inspiring way. And so I just want you to take a second and just applaud each of you for coming here for yourself and for the lives of all the people that you're going to touch. So give all of yourselves a hand if you would. <laughs> it's a powerfully right and a good thing that you're here, and so I just want you to know that that's true. Now, so... In the context of woundedness, let me tell you a little bit about my story. Not a pretty one, I'll tell you that. I, uh, it took me a long time to understand this, but once I did it, it explained a lot of things. That, um, that I'm actually somewhere on the autism spectrum. And people think, oh, Glenn, how can you be a teacher and all that kind of stuff and be on the autism spectrum? And I think, yeah, you haven't spent much time with me. Yeah. <laughs> Put me in a new social situation where I don't know people, and you'll think, oh, Glenn, you are so awkward. Yes. <laughs> so, so imagine this kid. He goes to school, elementary school. I literally don't talk. I don't say anything to anybody out loud until I'm in second grade. Let well, me just think about that. So here's this kid, incredibly shy, so quiet, zero social skills. I've now been married to Glenn. Where's my honey, buddy? Thank you. I've now been married to my very extroverted wife for many, many years, 36 now, and she's taught me a lot. So now I know, like, five things. <laughs> And if any of you were greeted by me today and felt welcome, then that's one of my things. <laughs> so, so I started off knowing literally nothing about relationships, and the fact that God uses me to teach people about relationships just proves that God really does have a sense of humor. Now, I also had a very crooked spine, and so I was bent over, which other kids found very attractive, and, um, and meant that I was in constant pain. Even now, if I move wrong or something bumps my spine, um, I can only compare it to being electrocuted. Like, every part of my body, like, burns in a way that's like... Yeah. Uh, luckily, I also had really, really thick Coke bottle glasses. <laughs> the shy, hunched over kid who doesn't talk, bent over, in constant pain, wears thick glasses. You can imagine exactly how many friends I had. The only people who talked to me were the bullies, and they didn't exactly have nice things to say to me. Now... So I kind of didn't understand the point of relationships, to be honest, or even how to have one. And the only person I was actually really close to was my dad, and of course he died when I was 19. That's not a pretty story. Now, and I came to believe that my name, and God gives us a new name when we finally figure out who we are, but I came to believe that my name was, I've been so hurt. Because I was. The world was really harsh with me. It was painful. And I came to believe that that was my name. I've been so hurt. Now, we're going to come back to that, so I just want you to remember. That's what I used to think my name was. Now, when I was going to engineering school, I, um, I did indeed end up taking a class in psychology, and it kind of opened up my eyes. It taught me this thing, which I had no idea could possibly be true, that people actually did things for reasons. I know it seems obvious, right? But honestly, it all seems so random to me. <laughs> that the thought that there might be a pattern to all that was really, really eye-opening. And I began to believe that it was possible that I could actually learn enough to actually have relationships with people and maybe even, you know, be happy. It was a stunning concept for me at 19, I'll tell you that, given what I believed my name to be. So that has started me on a 40-year quest to learn everything I can about relationships, what works, what doesn't, and what makes us happy. And so in that process... I did finish my degree in electrical engineering. I did indeed, as Kathy was saying, go back to school, to seminary, become a United Methodist pastor. Felt called to a specialized ministry, got my PhD in um, psychology, and was a psychologist for a long time. But all through that, what I've actually been is a teacher. And so my goal here with you is to just share all the things I've learned along the way, because I really believe that that's what we're all called to do, to take all the stuff we've been through, to take our wounds, to take all the things we've learned in the process of struggling with that, and teach other people because there's something powerful that happens in that process. Now, 
So that's what we're going to be about today, and we'll see if that works. <laughs> now, so one of the first things I learned most powerfully is this. We can't change anything about our lives unless we're willing to change our thinking, because everything goes in this order, think, feel, do. My thinking totally drives my emotions, and my emotions are what drive my behavior. Now, how many of you this past January had a New Year's resolution? Yeah, my resolution was to not have resolutions anymore. All right, so um, and I've kept mine perfect. <laughs> not a lot of people can claim that. Um, here's the problem with most of them. We decide we're going to change a behavior. But remember, everything goes think, feel, do. The do part is the absolute end of that tail. So if my thinking doesn't change, my behavior never changes, which is why so many resolutions don't work. So let's say I think, okay, I really want to have more money. By the end of this year, I want to have more money. Okay. But what I believe, and I did grow up in this family, I, what I believe is that I was really poor. I was always going to be poor. Everybody in my family is poor. That's just how it was. We were never going to have any money. Okay. So I think, okay, I really want to have more money by the end of the year. But what I believe about myself is that I'll never have any money. So, there's a promotion at work, and somebody says, hey, Glenn, you should apply to that. And I think to myself, yeah, they would never hire me to do that. And I not only don't get the job, I don't even apply for the job. A friend of mine is doing direct sales stuff, and he says, hey, Glenn, I could teach you that. You could be, work with me. You could actually make a lot more money than you make it now. And I think, ah, oh, I don't know. I probably wouldn't be able to do that. Because, see, I don't really believe that I could. And at the end of the year, how much money do I have? Same as what I had last year, right? Well, let's say I really want better relationships. I see myself as a victim. Remember, everything else, think, feel, do. So if I feel like a victim, how, how do I feel when I'm around people? Fearful, uncomfortable, anxious, right? So I keep them at a distance. So at the end of the year, what happened to my relationships? Nothing. We really need to understand if we want to change our life, not just a little teeny bit around the edges, but really, truly change it from the inside out, we have to change our thinking. There really is no other way. We have to change the way that we think. Now, this is why when it says in Romans, when Paul says that we're not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind, right? We literally have to transform our way of thinking. Same reason why the scriptures tell us in 2 Corinthians that we need to take every thought captive. If we want to change from the inside out, we need to change our thinking. Now, but we can't do it by ourselves. Einstein once said, the same brain that got me stuck in this place is not going to get me out. But I think that's true. If I get obsessed about something and I keep thinking about it, what happens? I just get more obsessed, right? I just dig that hole deeper. So I either need somebody else, like a counselor or somebody who would help me think differently, or I need to go to prayer and let God help me think differently because I'm not going to get there by myself. So sometimes people come to me and say, Glenn, I know i got a problem with the way I think and I've been working on that myself. And I think, well, yeah. Hmm. <laughs> I'm guessing that's not working for you. I'm guessing that's not working for you because we literally can't do it by ourselves. So we just need to understand. We can't do it by ourselves. And even thinking that you're supposed to is one of your woundednesses. <laughs> I just made that up. Now, how many of us think we have a problem and I want to fix that by myself, right? But see, even thinking, you don't want to tell anybody what your problem is and you have to fix it by yourself is one of the places where you're wounded. Because none of us fix anything by ourselves. It's a crazy thought. And if I think I have to do it myself, see, that's the place where I'm hurt. That's the place where I'm broken. All right, so prayer is a great way to actually do that because God can help us change our thinking. So I'm just going to give you a little opening exercise, a real quick little thing we're going to do in a minute, partly um, so you can see what I mean about that concept about think, feel, do, partly so you can be welcoming to each other, um, and partly because I love being right. Now, um, so you're going to welcome each other in a minute, but I wanted to sort of set you up for that. There's a couple different ways we can welcome each other, my old way. Focus on myself, notice how awkward I am, how weird I feel, and how anxious this is to reach out to somebody else and wonder how they think I look and how I'm doing. <laughs> you can kind of guess how that usually went for me, right? <laughs> right? It's incredibly uncomfortable for me, and trust me, as an autistic person, I get uncomfortable. Now, so it's incredibly uncomfortable for me, but guess how it was for the other person? Also really uncomfortable. I swear to you, this is true. In God's world, everything's either a win-win or a lose-lose. So if I'm uncomfortable, when I get the other person because I'm too focused on me, it's bad for me and it's bad for them. They don't feel welcome. Or I can take just a minute and actually focus on them. And I want to be there for them and helping them to feel welcome and make them glad that they're here and make them know that they really are precious and make them feel like, I'm so glad I came today. Now, and when I do that, it's way better for them, but guess who else has way more fun doing it? 
Right, it's a total win-win. Everything God puts on our heart without exception is a win-win. Now, sometimes when I ask people to do something God has put on their heart, they're like, ah, I don't really want to do that because I don't want to be selfish. I don't want to just be thinking about myself. And I think, ugh, you think you're special. <laughs> now, here's what God is always telling me, these two things. Glenn, you're very precious, but you're not special. I'm, not, I'm precious to him, but not because I'm so incredibly charismatic. <laughs> Although, of course, I am. But I'm precious to God because every one of his children is precious to God. So I'm precious, but I'm not special. My preciousness doesn't make me different. It makes me the same as everybody else. Now, so think about this. So God loves me and every one of his children exactly as much. Is he going to put something on my heart that's good for me but bad for the rest of his children? Doesn't make any sense. So when Jesus is telling this parable about what's the kingdom like, he tells a whole series of them. And finally he says, it's like a mustard seed. It starts out small, grows into this big bush. And mostly people stop quoting the passage right there. But that's not where it ends. He says, it grows into this big bush so that even the birds of the field can make nests in its branches. If you do what you're called to do, amazing, big things happen, and it blesses who? Everybody. That's how it always goes. Every single time, everything God does for us is a win-win. So, you're going to do this win-win thing in just a second. So, by first, we've got to get your mind right. So, I'm going to ask that you just take a minute and be at prayer, and let God just help you really get your mind thinking right. Ask God to help you really focus on the other person, see what's great about them, help them feel welcome. Help, ask God to help you picture how cool that will be to welcome other people, let them know they're among brothers and sisters, help them feel welcome. I'm asking this because I would just want everybody here to feel welcome, and also because I love having people learn as much as they can, and people who are comfortable learn better. Okay, so take a minute. Be at prayer if you would. Let God get your mind right. And welcome seven people who are somewhere around you if you would. Go. I don't mean have a long, long talk with them. I mean welcome them. Seven times, greet them, let them know you're glad they're here. Find somebody else, greet them, let them know you're glad they're here. Keep moving, seven people, say hi, tell them you're happy. All right, keep it moving. Keep greeting more people. Don't get stuck. Greet everybody around you. Say hi. Tell them you're glad they're here. I have a friend over here who needs to be greeted. Glad to have you. Go welcome Christy, would you? Okay, greet one more person if you would, and then come back. Find somebody you haven't greeted yet. Be welcoming to them. All right, come on back. Come back, come back, wherever you are. All right. Now, here's a really cool thing. Let's say I do that greeting thing, and I'm real focused on myself and not on other people. How loud is that interaction? Soft, awkward. What happened the instant you got up and all of you decided to focus on somebody else? What happened to the energy in this room? It exploded, right? When we let God work on us, even in that simplest little way, that exploding thing is what happens. It's a joyful thing, it's a happy thing, it's a connecting thing. Now, so I want you to notice. So you ask God to let you, to get your mind right. So how did it feel then to be greeting people? Just shout out a word, everybody. I want to hear half a dozen people. Just how did it feel to greet everybody? Good, Good joyful, great. Other words? Easy. Easy. Comfortable. Comfortable. Loving, thank you. Right, because when I just let God get my mind right, then my emotions flow in a certain direction, which is positive, and then how did I go to greet people? You all doing it lovingly, gently, caringly, powerful. I just want you to notice, even on this simplest little thing, that that think, feel, do thing is always true. And if I want to change anything about my behavior, I've got to be really serious about being willing to change my thinking. I can't have the same thinking and have a different outcome. 
Now, in the 12-step program where they talk about, you know, the definition of insanity, is to keep doing things the same way and expect the outcome to be different, I think, why? See, as long as my thinking is the same, my outcome will never be different. I can't start from the same old place I always start from and think I'm going to end up somewhere else in the end. I will end up exactly the same place I always do. All right, so, so we need to change our thinking and we need to let God help us. That's the most powerful way. Now, today I want to work on two different kinds of our thinking, our automatic thoughts and our conscious thoughts. We're going to spend some time doing each one. But I'm going to talk to you about the specific kinds of conscious and automatic thoughts I want us to work on today, because we're going to work mostly on the way that we see ourselves and others, especially in relation to God. Now, the relational piece, of course, that's what I do in my day job, so I'm working always with people on their relationships. But I don't do that because that's what's easiest for me. I do it because I'm absolutely convicted that this is true. This is the most fundamental, fundamentally important thing we could ever be working on. So... Um, and I think this is why God then always puts such a powerful emphasis on healing that part of our life. We tend to think of healing as being physical, and you know, sometimes it can be, and great. But the thing that God is most interested in healing is our relationships to one another and to God. As nearly as I can tell, those are the most important things, and therefore those are the, thing, the kinds of healing that God is always focused on, which is why well, that's what we're going to do today. So those are our deepest kind of wounds, and those are the wounds that God's most interested in. So if you flip to page two with me, just to kind of help you understand what I'm thinking. So God gives us a great commandment that we're supposed to love God and do what? And love our neighbor as ourselves, right? In other words, if I get this relationship right and I get these relationships right, the rest of my life's going to go okay. That's when, um, and as nearly as I can tell, even in the physical healing stories in the Bible, really the whole point of being healed is just so they can be back in community and tell other people. So right away in Jesus' ministry, he heals Simon's mother-in-law and then she gets up and serves them. Just after that, he heals a person with leprosy and tells him to go back to the priest. In other words, go through the ritual of rejoining what? Your community. There's a legion demonic who has all these demons, and Jesus heals them and tells him to go back to his friends and family, go home and tell them what God did for you. In other words, be back in your community and let them know what happened for you. Um, he heals a dead girl in Mark 5. <laughs> Everybody else says he did. He says, no, she's just sleeping. They laugh at him, of course. He says, Tabitha, arise. She arises. And he tells them, get her something to eat. <laughs> the more you read those healing stories, the more funny it is. It's like, so this amazing, amazing thing happens, and Jesus says, would you get her something to eat? <laughs> okay. <laughs> My daughter who was dead has come back to life. <laughs> I can hardly even imagine that. I can hardly even speak. Uh, would you go get her something to eat? Okay. So... Because it's part of being back in the family, right? Because who eats? In Jesus' time, if you sat down at supper, who are you sitting down with? Your funerary, right? The people who are closest to you, your family and your closest friends. So if somebody gets you something to eat, that means you're back in the family. All right. And then um, and he invites the rich young ruler. He says, hey, come and join us. In other words, be in our community instead of thinking about yourself. And finally, he sends out the disciples two by two. Because no matter what we do, we do it in a relationship. As far as I can tell, from God's perspective, there literally isn't anything that could possibly be even nearly as important as our relationships and living our lives in community in those relationships. So, when I ask you to pray for others and to welcome them, I just want you to know, because so you could feel more connected to them and so that they could feel more connected. So I just want you to understand, just asking God to change my mind so I can be welcoming instead of focused on myself means then I can claim my place in the community because to belong, as nearly as I can tell from God's perspective, to reclaim our connectedness is the deepest and most fundamental form of healing. As nearly as I can tell, all forms of healing are actually just that in one way or another. Now, I want you to notice... The healing you experience this moment, when you ask, just for a second, when you ask God, change your mind, you go out and greet people, and you felt loving, joyful, comfortable, happy, all those things. I just want you to notice there's a healing moment there. Because just before that, you were feeling not that way. Right? I just want you to notice how fast that healing happens. I ask God to fix my mind, I change it the way I feel, I put that into action, and my life is different. How fast can it be? Wow. <laughs> that fast. There's a healing. And then we're all part of a community in a whole different sort of way. Now, how many of you are still feeling different just because we did that for a minute? Different than you were when we first came in. So, I just want you to notice, even just that simplest little thing, it shifts us and it sticks with us. All right. So, and if either God, that form of healing is the most important thing. Now, that explains then why the literal definition of sin is separate. 
want you to think about that just for a second. The literal meaning of sin is separate. Now, mostly when I hear legalistic people talk about sin, they make it really clear that in their mind, the opposite of sin is moral behavior as defined by them. But see, the opposite of sin is not moral behavior. The opposite of sin is to live my life in right relationship. Because sin means separate. And everything the opposite of sin would be to be connected to one another and to God. Love your God and love your neighbor as yourself. So, we just need to understand the incredible importance of healing our relationships. We have to be about that above all. Now, but we have to be open to it. So I'm going to have you ask in just a minute, and here's how it comes. All those healing narratives, you'll notice Jesus asks the person first a question. So, him and the disciples, Mark 10, are walking down the road to Jericho. They walk past blind Bartimaeus, a blind beggar on the side of the road, who called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. People tell him, shut up, shut up, but he keeps yelling. He's nothing if not persistent. Now, finally Jesus said, okay, call him over. So they call him over. So here's Bartimaeus standing in front of Jesus, and Jesus said, what do you want? <laughs> Well, I'm a blind beggar. Maybe we could, you know, start with that. <laughs> I'd like my sight back. And Jesus said, great, done. He asked what he wants, and then it happened. So what did I ask you to do first? I asked you to ask God to shift your mind, right? You need to be open to it. Same thing over and over we see in the scriptures. Um, just like when Jesus comes back home in Mark 6, um, they didn't believe in him. They didn't believe he could do anything, so they didn't ask. And it says, and he could do no mighty works there, except that he healed a few sick people. That part always makes me laugh. <laughs> he could do no mighty works there, except, you know, just heal a few sick people. <laughs> but, because they didn't believe, they didn't ask, and so pretty much nothing happened. I just want you to understand, God will not violate our free will. Will not. We have to ask. So I'm going to have you take a second right now and ask. So I want you to just be a prayer, just to ask that God does indeed bring healing into your life this very morning. Just want you to ask that and be open to it. And we need to make a commitment. In Jesus' time, he stood by the gate and announced something three times, then it was binding. So I want you to tell three people around you this sentence. I choose today to be open to healing. Ready? Go tell three people around you. I choose today to be open to healing. All right. Thank you for being committed. This is good. Are you having fun yet? All right. So, so we're going to talk about healing, and we're going to start with our um, automatic thoughts. Now, probably you guys are a more advanced group of people because a lot of you are Methodists, so <laughs> you probably already know you're perfect, right? You don't? I've known a few perfect Methodists. All right. Now, here's an interesting thing. I want to talk about our deepest or most automatic thoughts. I often start, as a seminar of mine that I do, and I often start by saying, okay, I'm going to give you a word or a phrase, and I want you guys to write down whatever word or phrase has come to your mind as soon as I say that. And I say a couple of ones to kind of just get them warmed up, and then I say, you are perfect, and I ask them to write down everything that comes to their mind. Guess what they write down? Of course. <laughs> That's what most of them say, right? Okay, what do they actually say mostly? No. <laughs> and why not? Why do they tell me they're not? Because they made mistakes, blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. Right? Now, and sometimes they'll even say, well, yeah, in God's sight. Yeah, I am perfect in God's sight. And I want you to just think about that sentence just for a second. God is a source of all truth. Everything that's true comes from God and is of God. So if I say I am perfect, but only in God's sight, what I'm saying is, yes, I am perfect, but only in reality. (laughs) 
Compared to what? I, I want you to think about that. You're only perfect in reality. Now, compared to what? Compared to those crazy voices we got going on in the back of our head. Those voices aren't God's voice. That's always been clear to me because God's voice isn't anywhere near as mean as the voices that talk in the back of my head. <laughs> But I've really come to understand this. Not only is that not God's voice, it's not even mine. I want you to think about that. That voice that talks in the back of your head is not actually you either. Here's how it comes. I've been having a lot of fun the last eight or ten years studying a field called epigenetics, which is the study of how the environment affects us genetically. It affects literally our very DNA. And they first started understanding this years ago when they studied geese. You know, geese by instinct fly to the south or a certain place in the winter. Okay. Now, if the place they fly to is dried up, so they have to fly around to find a new place, then they fly back here, and in the spring, you know, they have little babies, and in the fall, the babies fly, guess where? To the new place. Every time. Because, see, we, the old geese have that experience. It changes their way of thinking, and are their brain cells literally change. And when they have babies, the babies get those brain cells. Now, the same thing happens to all of us. Every one of our brain cells reproduces itself roughly every 20 days. And, it, and if I learn something new or see a different way of thinking about something, it changes that brain cell, and then when it reproduces, it reproduces this new self. Your thinking, we change your thinking, literally changes your brain, and that change will continue on because that brain will now replicate that new self. So, all the books about, you know, 21 days to a new habit, all that stuff, see, they're really based on the same understanding. Every 20 days, every one of your brain cells turns over. And if you just keep thinking the same old thoughts, then you just keep reproducing the same old brain cells. They just keep reproducing themselves as they were. When you think differently, when you've been transformed from the inside out, your brain cells get changed, they get altered, and they, when they reproduce themselves, they reproduce the altered form, the new form. Now, here's why it's so important. We think we're sort of stuck being the way we are with all of our old thoughts, but it's not true, and it's helpful to know that it's not true, and here's how it comes. Right after Moses gets the, new commandment, or the, gets the Ten Commandments, and he's writing them down on the stone. And then, basically, there's this little speech where God, sort of through Moses, says, if you obey these Ten Commandments, all will be well with you. If not, it's going to go bad for you and your kids and your kids' kids. Hmm. Now, I've heard a lot of people talk about that legalistically. Like, yeah, if you do it right, that's fine, but if not, I'm going to kick your butt, your kids' butt, and your kids' kids' butt, just to prove that I could. But see, that's not the point. The point is this. If I live my life and according to certain great standards, and I really think and start behaving and thinking about the world and thinking about myself and others in a certain way, my kids get those new brain cells when I have them. If I have really icky, distorted, hurtful, hateful thoughts, that's the brain that reproduces itself. And when I have kids, they get that brain. You literally got thoughts in your brain that aren't yours, that you literally inherited. So people like to talk about that Exodus thing and talk about generational sin, about how sin gets passed on to generations. But generational goodness also gets passed on. So I just want you to understand, everything we do right also changes our brain and gets passed on. So it's not a hopeless thing. I just want you to understand. Now, so in Psalm 51, the first passage I ever preached on, you can imagine a Autistic kid in his first year of seminary preaching. <laughs> yeah, it kind of went like that. <laughs> it's a beautiful passage about being reborn, about being recreated by God, acknowledging our sin and asking God to recreate us. So it's a powerful, powerful passage. But it says this thing in there that really kind of tweaked me back then. It says, you know, I'm, I'm sinful since my mother conceived me, which I used to hate that, but now I get it. Because see, here's the thing. We don't start off as a blank slate. We don't. We start off with ideas that we literally got passed on to us. My grandfather Hanson, his generation, so my mom's dad, he had four brothers and they all died of alcohol. So when I say that family was alcoholic, I don't mean they drank occasionally. I mean they literally died, all four of his brothers, from drinking at very early ages. So he saw that and he thought, well, I'm not going to be doing that. So, you know, I always think the smartest people do their learning vicariously. 
learning from other people's mistakes is a really great way to learn. <laughs> Keeps you from having to make them yourself, if you're smart. So he decided he wasn't going to do that. So then his kids, so my mom's generation, they all grew up as a real teetotaler, we're not doing that, blah, blah, blah. And so they have all those sort of judgmental about anybody who's alcoholic kind of characteristics. And they all have my generation. Every person in my generation was literally born codependent, over-responsible, taking, running my life and everybody else's, super controlling, super afraid to do anything wrong, never want to make a mistake, blah, 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 blah. We were literally born with the thought, you should never ask what you want. <laughs> I didn't come up with that thought myself. I was literally born with that thought. Now, and all of us have incredibly unhelpful thoughts that we were literally born with. And so when I talk about transforming our thinking, I need you to understand, we're talking about transforming stuff that you literally never came up with yourself, that you were literally born with, that you came to this earth with, that you started with. Let me help you see just how true that is. How many people in here have a fear of heights? I do too, by the way. My family thinks it's real funny. They stand on the edge of a cliff and laugh. And <laughs> yeah, that one especially. And think that's funny. All right, now. So keep your hands up just for a second, all those of you who are afraid of heights. Okay, now. How many of you, as a child, fell a great height and were desperately hurt? <laughs> right. right? We don't develop that fear because we had that experience. So if somebody says, I have a fear of heights, I want you to think, from what? You didn't fall down, you didn't get hurt, nothing bad ever actually happened to you, so you have a fear of heights based on what? A thought that I have in the back of my head that I was literally born with. Now, same with claustrophobia. How many people here are claustrophobic? Hate those little spaces? Yeah, I just tried to take an MRI, freaked out. All right, now, here's an interesting thing. So we think, for those of us who are claustrophobic, well, of course, I'm afraid of small spaces, right? Who wouldn't be? My cat would beg to differ. <laughs> Guess where she thinks is the safest place in the house? Got my little corner, like me down there. I'm all, you know, they love those small spaces. They, that's where they feel safe. So there are different ways we could think about that, but all of us who are claustrophobic think, oh, that's scary. Again, based on what? They all came out of a womb, for goodness sakes. You should find small spaces really comforting, same as my cat. But all of us who are claustrophobic, we don't, we freak out, right? Because we think that's, makes, it's anxious, right? Why do we think that? I swear to God, we didn't make it up. Those of us who are claustrophobic came into the world believing that that's scary. Okay, now, so I tell you that just to tell you this. <laughs> so, the first reason why we're so dismissive of the truth about ourselves, so I say you're perfect, it's absolutely true, and we tend to be dismissive of that. Oh, yeah, right, no way, blah, 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 only in God's sight. Yeah, only in reality. We're so dismissive of that for this reason, because we are predisposed to believe the lie. We are literally born with a brain that believes a serpent that we're the opposite of perfect, that there's something wrong with us. That's why when some idiot like Glenn Pickering comes along and tells you you're perfect, you dismiss it so fast, you never even entertain the thought that it might be true. But you'll learn that you'll discover over time that I'm always right. So, <laughs> so you just start right now and just start believing everything I tell you. Now, so, but it's important to understand why are we so dismissive of this thing that's so clearly true, that you are perfect? It says it right in the Bible. We're so dismissive because we were literally born with a lie that said that's not true that there's something terribly wrong with us, like fundamentally wrong with us, and, um, and we believe that, there's, that we're not good enough. So the same Bible story I was just talking about with Adam and Eve, why did they eat the apple? Because somebody, somebody convinced them, what? That there was something wrong with them. Didn't even know the difference between good and evil, for crying out loud. You call yourself smart. And because they believed that lie, that there was something wrong with them, they ate the apple. So people talk about the original sin, and we need to understand, the original sin is not that they ate the apple. The original sin is that they believed they needed to. God says you're perfect exactly as you are, and they believe the lie that they're not. 
And we were literally born, every one of us, with some version of that lie. And we have to transform that lie if we're actually going to live a right life. Now, so, God said, okay, you can believe that lie if you want, but your life's going to be way harder. So he said, you'll be cursed. Now, notice, it's really powerful. People get all weird about that, like God cursed them. He did not. He just said, you will be cursed. Your life will be way harder if you believe that. Everything will be harder if you believe that. Not cursed like I'm being bad to you, cursed like that's what happens. Just like in Galatians, Paul said, cursed are those who live under the law. Right. He's not saying you're a bad person. He's not saying I curse you. He's just saying if you think doing everything right is the way to get to heaven, well, see, it's never going to work for you. You can't do it. You, you're literally doomed to failure. Curse just means it will never work for you. You were doomed to failure. Same with when the um, prodigal son says to the dad, well, give me everything I have coming to me. I'm just going to go out by myself. I just want to do it by myself. Well, if I believe about my life that I'm just here to do it by myself, see, I'm cursed. Again, not cursed because somebody curses me. Cursed like that will never work. Like I'm doomed to failure because that way won't work. And so they leave the garden believing that there's something wrong with them. And God's like, okay, but that's going to be way harder. Everything about your life will be harder if you believe that lie. Instead of believing the truth that uh, we're very good, as God says, that we're precious in his sight, that we're created in his image. So the first kind of transformation we need if we're going to transform our thinking is we need to work hard at transforming our really, really old thoughts, the ones that we're literally born with. And until we are transformed, um, the old lies just keep us trapped in slavery. We just keep doing the same things over and over again and wondering why we're not happy. And I think, yep, we keep going back to our built-in patterns, just like the Galatians. Paul's like, you went back to slavery already? What? Because until our thoughts are transformed, we don't really have any freedom. We just keep doing things the way we always do. Because everything goes think, feel, do. If I don't change my thinking, what happens to my feeling and my doing? They also stay the same. Nothing ever happens. I'm stuck where I am. And they keep going back to those patterns that don't work. Now, the truth always leads to new life. That's the cool thing. And so we are a new creation in Christ, it says in 2 Corinthians. We are born then back into our true selves. I'll talk about this more later, but I want you to think about this carefully. When God recreates you, I want you to really understand, that's exactly what happens. God recreates you. God doesn't train you into somebody else. God helps you get back to the person that you were supposed to be all along. I just want you to think about that for a second. So when the Bible talks about the refiner's fire, I think, right, if you take a lump of gold and put it through the refiner's fire, what happens to the gold? Right, nothing. But all the impurities get burned off, right? And so when God said, Glenn, I want to recreate you, he's not saying, Glenn, there's something wrong with you and I have to make you somebody else. He's saying, Glenn, my goal is to bring you back to the one that I created right from the beginning. We're recreated. We're not created. We're recreated. We're reborn into the life that we're supposed to have from the beginning. So we need to understand, when the Bible makes us that promise that we'll be recreated, that's what it means. Now, Jesus says the path is indeed narrow in Matthew 7, and the way is indeed hard, and I think white. Here's what I noticed. There are many, many call narratives in the Bible, a story where God or an angel comes down to earth to call somebody to do something. And here's what I noticed never happens. They never come down and say to the person, I came all the way down from heaven down to earth to tell you this, just keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> In your prayer life, is that ever what you hear? Hey, Glenn, just keep doing what you're doing. You hear that? No. You hear challenging things that are putting your heart about how you could be different, about how you could make a difference, about somebody you could reach out to, about somebody whose life you're supposed to touch. Well, that's challenging stuff, right? It's not the easy way. When Jesus said the, way is, the path is narrow and the way is not easy, that's what he's trying to say. I'm not here to tell you, yeah, just keep doing what you're doing. I'm here to challenge you right down to the way you think so you can finally start doing the stuff I really would ask you to do, which is challenging stuff. It's not easy. It's hard. Now, and I just think, and all of you are here doing that hard work, and I think that's really cool. Because to have the life that God wants us to have is work. We can't just coast to there. We can't just put it on cruise control and get there. We have to do this hard work of being transformed from the inside out. And so I applaud you for doing that. And I want you to know, Jesus talks about the path. Jesus talks about the way. I think, right, getting from where we are into transformation is a process. As humans, we get so crazy. We always want to think, okay, am I done yet? How many of you remember back when you were a little kid, keep asking your mom and dad, are we there yet? Are we there yet? 
Well, I've got to tell you, if you're still here on earth, you're not there yet. <laughs> you're partly there, but you're not there. So God wants to continue to grow us and to learn us and transform us. That's an ongoing process. Every 20 days, you get a whole new set of brain cells that keep changing them, changing them, changing them, changing them, get sanctified over time. That's a process. Now, here's why that's so incredibly important. We need to understand, if we commit ourselves to Christ, it's like a wedding vow. And because I was a Methodist minister before, as a psychologist, I still get to um, you know, perform weddings from time to time. And I said to a couple a while back when we were preparing their vows, I said, you need to understand, when you do your vows, you're not committing yourself to a person, although it kind of looks like that. You're committing yourself to a process. In sickness and in health, richer for poor, no matter what happens, we're going to work together, figure it out, be a team. That's what we're going to do. You're committing yourself to a way of being. And when we commit ourselves to Christ, that's what we're doing too. We're committing ourselves to a way of being where we continue to grow and continue to learn and continue to be more and more and more the person that God created us to be right from the beginning. All right. So we need to change our automatic thoughts, and we're going to work on that some today. Now, we also need to heal our conscious thoughts. I, uh, if you read the scriptures long enough, you start to think, oh man, this book should be retitled, the gospel, Jesus, the man from Galilee and the Twelve Stooges. <laughs> how often do we hear this story? So Jesus wants to talk to them about how he's the bread of life, and they're like, what are you talking about? We just had breakfast. <laughs> After he feeds the 5,000, they're in the boat. They just saw 5,000 people get fed. And Jesus wants to talk to them about beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. You know, that legalistic stuff that can kind of get in there and then wreck everything if you're not careful. So he talks to them, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And the disciples were confused because there was only one loaf of bread in the boat. Honest to God, read the passage. <laughs> beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Huh. God, I thought we only had a little bit of bread. Right after that, he gets out of the boat, meets the Pharisees on the other side, and they want a sign. He says, I'm not going to give you one. And people give all thought, a lot of theological sermons about why he doesn't. Blah, blah, blah. But honestly, that make it way too complicated. Here's why he doesn't. He says right after that, you see the storm clouds coming, and you know there's a storm coming, but you can't read the signs in front of you to save your life. I've healed the blind. I've healed the sick. The lame walk the blind sea, and we just fed 4,000 people from two loaves of bread and a couple of fish. And you're waiting for a sign. <laughs> what am I going to do with you people? Right? <laughs> now, what we don't get is we are those disciples. Now, here's how I come. I tell people, you know, God says you're perfect. And right away they argue with me, which by now you should know is always wrong. But what's their first reason why they're going to tell me that they're not perfect? Because they make a lot of mistakes. I want you to picture Jesus doing this. Hey, Glenn, you're perfect. Oh, no, I make mistakes. Oh, God. I don't even know about the living of the Pharisees. We only have one piece of bread here. Man. Come on, man. Track with me. Now, so we think perfect means not making any mistakes, which still, when somebody like Glenn Pickering comes along and says you're perfect, then your old brain starts consciously coming up with all the reasons why it's not true. But here's what would be a better use of your brain than arguing about whether that could be true or not. A better use of your brain would be to think, okay, when Jesus says it would be perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect in Matthew, or if you want to be perfect, sell all that you have and follow me also in Matthew, instead of arguing about whether we're perfect, we could maybe start asking God what the heck that might actually mean. What from a godly perspective, not a worldly perspective, where we think perfect is just you don't make mistakes, that's stupid. What from a godly perspective would perfect mean? Now that's a more helpful question, isn't it? Now, let me tell you what it means. Here's God's definition of perfect. Being a toddler, learning how to walk. So a little kid, they crawl around, they pull themselves up on the couch, they summon up all their courage, 
and they let go of the couch. And they take two steps, and then they fall down. And that is perfect. They have felt the call to do something. They summoned up their courage to do it. They tried it. They made a mistake, which means now they learned something, and now they're going to do it what? Better. That's perfect. I feel the call God puts in my heart. I summon up my courage. I try to listen. I give that my best shot. I make mistakes. I learn something from my mistakes, and then I do it better. That's perfect. From a godly perspective, that's what perfect looks like. It's a process, just like sanctification. Now, so I have to be bold enough to accept God's abundant life, as Jesus talked about in John 10. I have to be willing to try stuff as we move towards that vision, instead of being paralyzed with fear. We have to make mistakes and acknowledge them. Now, I've talked a little bit about the game of tag in my one-minute commercial, but see, we get so afraid of claiming our mistakes like that would mean that we're bad or something. But see, all of that just comes from the thought I have in the back of my head that there's something wrong with me, and my most fearful thought is if you knew that I made a mistake that would just confirm for you that there really was something wrong with me. But see, if I get I'm perfect, exactly as God created me, then my mistakes just mean that I made a mistake. And you need to learn something and do that better. Now, so that's why humility is important. Not humility like I'm worse or bad, I've got low self-esteem for crying out loud. Humility just means when I make a mistake, I just claim it. Because there's something there to be learned. Now, people who die and cross over, I love reading about near-death experiences. People die, cross over, come back, tell us what it's like. They tell us consistently there's only two things we take with us, love and wisdom. So everybody we loved on this side, we still love from the other side. So all the people who have gone before you, it's just important to know they still love you exactly as they did, except probably more. So we take love with us. We also take wisdom. In other words, all the stuff that we learn. So from God's perspective, there's two reasons why you're here. <laughs> Loving other people, learning lessons. Now, here's the interesting part. Guess what most of those lessons are about? I love other people. <laughs> so. so, when I tell you perfect is, you hear the call, you try stuff, you make mistakes, you learn something, and you get better. You need to understand. God's like, wait. That's just what I was hoping for. You were doing it perfectly. Exactly as I envisioned for you. So that little toddler falls down a few times, gradually they lean a little farther forward, they get a little smarter, and they start walking. And we're like, oh, that's so great. And we call everybody and tell them our kid's walking. Do we say, although, actually, I don't know, they, they did fall down a lot first. <laughs> kind of embarrassed to admit that. <laughs> My kid didn't learn how to walk right away. They had to fall down a few times first. Do we tell them that? No, what do we tell them? Oh, my kid's walking, it's so cool. Of course, then they start putting their fingers in the light sockets and it's not as cool, but... <laughs> they understand what I mean. We're so excited that they did it. And of course they made mistakes along the way. Of course they fell down. Of course they picked themselves up. Of course they tried again, of course. How else are you going to get there? If we live our life perfectly, we're always in that process of hearing God's call on us, trying our best, making mistakes along the way, giving it our best shot, learning something, and then teaching others when we learn it. Now, yeah. here's the warning, Matthew 25. Jesus tells a story about the guy who had one talent, the person who had two talents, and the person who had five talents. And the people who had two and five, they went out and did something with their talents, but the person who had one talent, what did they do? They buried it because they were afraid. Now, in the story Jesus tells that the master was furious. That's when you hear that. The one way to make God really, really angry is to have those skills, know that you're called to use them, but be so afraid of making a mistake that you don't. That's just gonna, there's a warning there. I just need to understand. If I really, really want to be listening to God's call in my life, I try stuff, I take, I'm bold, I get out there, I try stuff, I fail, I fall down, I learn something, and I get better. That's perfect. Now, so, but Jesus tells us, don't hang on to your old definition of perfect about not making mistakes, because then you're going to be that guy with one talent. And that's the only place in the scripture I hear Jesus saying, and the master was furious. It's the only way to actually make God mad. 
to let our fear keep us from living the life that we're called to live. Now, so, it's okay. You can cling to your version of perfect, avoiding all mistakes. But you need to understand, your definition makes God mad. Furious. So you can hold on to that if you want. But you need to know this. Any thoughts you have going through your head, thoughts about not being perfect, are in direct opposition to God's truth and his will for your own life. So, you need to consciously start focusing on the truth. Because the source of all truth says that you're very good, precious in his sight, a child after his own heart, created in his likeness, and called to live that out. So, of course, you're free to dismiss all of that, because that's only, you know, God's way of thinking. That's only reality. We can cling to our crazy things if we want to, but it's not helpful to us. Now, so, perfect, then, is a process. It's that way of living. So, Apostle Paul says in this beautiful in Philippians 3, I press on, not that I've already attained this, but I press on towards the goal of the upward call of Christ Jesus. And I think, right, we always want God's praise for what we want to accomplish. But God is only interested in what we learned and how we treated people in that process. So, the people who die and cross over tell us that they basically see this picture of their life, like this whole, like the, you see a whole life almost at one time, but sort of it's sequentially. And they tell us that everything that they see is about how they treated other people and the impact that they had on them and on the other person. There's no pausing to savor all the successes because God could care less about your successes or your failures. He cares a lot about how you treat people along the way to that success and failure and whether you learn the lessons that he wants you to learn so that you become better at being your best self. Now, so we want God's praise for how we do it, but God's only interested in what we learn and how we treat people in that process. So we get all worried about our mistakes. God's only question, Glenn, did you learn anything from that mistake? I want to get on my knees and apologize to God for making a mistake, and God doesn't care. But he cares a lot about what happens next. And here's what I mean. Sometimes people say, well, Glenn, I'm my own, I am my own harshest critic. And I say, you need to understand that that's satanic. And I'm not kidding about that. Let's say I make a mistake that I often make. I think, Glenn, you're so dumb. You're never going to get it. I can't believe it. Blah, blah, blah. And I get all down on myself, all critical about myself. When do I learn? That whole process of beating myself up means not only do I not learn with the lesson I'm supposed to learn, I don't even ask what it is. I'm derailed already. God doesn't care about your mistakes, not at all. But God cares powerfully whether you actually choose to learn something because that's what perfect looks like. So the instant you make a mistake, I just want you to hear in the back of your voice, what's the lesson, what's the lesson, what's the lesson, what's the lesson? That's it. That's all God cares about. So please don't go to God apologizing for your mistakes. Go to God for the guidance about what it is you're supposed to learn from the mistake. God will happily answer that question for you, I promise. <laughs> All right. So, uh, okay, well, one last thought about that. So let's say the toddler, they do pull themselves up, they take their first step, they take two steps and they fall down, and then they look at us, right? Like, how should I feel about this? So if we're like, oh, honey, you did so great, they're like, oh, okay. And then what do they do? pull themselves back up and give another shot. But if they fall down and we're like, oh, honey, are you okay? Guess what they start doing? They start crying right where they are, and they don't get up. See, if we're not careful, we think our mistakes are so bad, we just sit there and want to cry. So God's like, yeah, you took a step, great. Get up. Do it again. Learn something, do it better. You'll get it. We need to understand, God does not condemn us for our mistakes. And that part of us, that back of our head that thinks that's true is crazy. God thinks, I love your mistakes. Keep doing them. Keep making them. Learn something. I want you to see yourself that little toddler. You fall down. You make a mistake. You look to God, and God's like, yeah. I see, yeah. Get up. Try it again, right? That's what you want your little kid to do. Now, okay, so... Ah, so here's the question. So we need to get our thinking, our conscious thinking lined up with the truth, and here's the question. Are you up for that? Yeah. I want to hear a yes if you are, because maybe you have to ask. Are you up for changing your conscious thinking? Yes. All right. <laughs> well, let's do that then. Remember, you asked. <laughs> All right. We're going to do our first exercise. Now, 
There's a fascinating study a while back of kids with high self-esteem, and you might think, oh, they're kids who think they're really great, but that's not true. Kids with high self-esteem are kids who really know what they're great at, and they really know what they're not great at, and they're okay with both of them. I want you to think about this. Does self-acceptance mean you think you do everything exactly the best of anybody? No. Self-acceptance means what? You see the things you're good at? You see the things you're not so good at? You see a way, way longer list of things you'll never be any good at? And you see that list and you think, yeah, that's about right, right? I see the whole list. I claim that list. So we need to understand, if we're going to get our conscious thinking right about who we are, we have to accept our gifts and our struggles in sort of the same equal way. And some of us have more trouble accepting our gifts, some of us have more trouble accepting our struggles, but it doesn't matter. We have to be able to accept each of them in the same sort of way. So we're going to practice both of those. So I'm going to have you take a prayerful moment right now and ask God this question. Well, here's what you're going to do. You're going to write down seven things that are great about me are, and you're going to be in that prayerful mode and just write down everything that comes to you, seven things. Now, it could be a really big thing, like I'm almost as funny as Glenn is, or <laughs> it could be some small thing, like today when I came into church, I opened the door for somebody, and I, I saw them smile when I looked at them, and I could tell that they felt honored that I opened the door for them. That was really great. Cool, I don't care. Big thing, little thing, doesn't matter. So take a prayerful moment, say, God, help me see seven things that are great about me, and I want you to write them down. Ready? Go. Okay, try to finish that up in a minute, and then we'll start our exercise. Okay, so the instructions are on your sheet. Here's the exercise. You're going to go to seven different people, and you're going to say one of the things on their list, and you're going to pick the next one. So the first person, you're going to say the first thing on your list, the second person, the second thing on your list, like that. So seven people here, seven different things about you. You're going to say, one thing that's great about me is, and you're going to tell them that thing, and they're going to say back to you, that's so cool that you know that about yourself. <laughs> I want you to think about how powerful that sentence is. It's so cool that you... Know that about yourself. Not it's so cool that that's true. It's so cool that you know that about yourself because I want your brain to hear, oh, yeah, that's right, I do know that. And then as soon as your brain thinks, oh, that's right, I do know that, there's a DNA shift. You're literally recreating your brain by telling, oh, that's right, I know that. Okay. And then, and then my brain thinks, okay. Because <laughs> my brain will do whatever I tell it to do. Now, so seven times you're going to say, one thing that's great about me is, and the other person is going to say, that's so cool that you know that about yourself. Then you're going to flip roles with that person. They're going to say, one thing that's great about me is, and you're going to say to them, that's so cool that you know that about yourself. You do that seven times, and you're going to come back to your seat. Any questions? Go.
Remember, when I have a day-long conversation, you say it, they say it back, you move on to the next person. Yes, you'll have to stand up and move around to do this. That's all right. about me is I love my kid. It's so cool that you know that about yourself. I do. Oh, yeah, it's cool about me is I've always been a daddy's girl. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. I'm going to go somewhere. It's going to Have you been sitting and listening or have you been out there? That's what I thought. Okay. Okay. Yeah. After the half time. I love my kid. Um, oh, I didn't watch Did you? Did you watch? Okay. Rachel. Yes. Hey, Fred. What's one thing that's great about you? Are you, sir? I'm good. I am a servant-minded. That's so cool that you know that about yourself. I'm so grateful. Uh -huh. Tell me something about you. I'm having a great time today. How good that you know that. I how myself. good that you're doing this. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, sir, thank you, sir, thank you. We're going to leave. I'm Come sorry. On. I'm sorry. You know, I, I know you got to go. It's going to be so cool, though. You know what? What's that? You've, you've done a lot of courses, a lot of programs, and we've attended a number right. of them. This is the best. This is for sure the best. This That's why I'm sad you're leaving. Because the exercises that are coming now are going to be really powerful. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You would know. I know that laugh anywhere. Hey, Chrissy, what's one thing that's great about you? I love the people I love really well. Nice, I like that. It's, it's cool that you know that about yourself. How about you? What's cool about Glenn? I'm having so much fun doing this. What? I'm having so much fun doing this. Also, that's, this is new for you. I love that, I know, that, you, I that you're doing something new. It's cool. Yeah, yeah. There's some energy that comes with that. Okay, try and finish up in the next minute or so, if you would, please. It's so good to see you. It's so good to see you. And I got to see you. I told right away. He goes, hey. And he just kind of pulled my chain, of course. Thank you. Welcome. Yes, come on back, if you would. Okay, we're going to group pray, 14 of us, over somebody who is, uh, oh, brave enough, foolish enough, desperate enough, or just interested in having 14 of us pray over you to change your conscious thinking. Great, come on up front. I need 14 people. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. Ready? Come on up. Okay, you'll be in the middle. Now, you have to bring your list of seven things. I made a mistake already, yes. <laughs> and you say you're perfect. <coughs> I'm going to group pray. Hang on a second. We're going to get there. 
No, you have to bring it. No, no, no. This is, this is not audience participation. Okay, come on. Yeah, you're going to be standing up here. You're going to be in the middle. We're all going to be putting our hands on this. You have to tell us the seven things. Each of us is going to take two of them. Ready? So first of all, just read us your list. And uh, hang on a second. Yes, you're going to be in the middle? Mm-hmm. In the middle? Yes. We can't all have our hands on it if you're over there. Ready? <laughs> yes. Okay, now. So... Two people are going to take each of the seven things you wrote down, and I'll tell you what you're going to do with that in a minute. So um, just read your seven one at a time, and we'll have two volunteers for each one. Kind. Okay, kind. Who's going to say kind? One other person. Great, okay. Love others. Love others. Who's going to say that one? Okay, great. Thank you. Third? Compassionate. Okay, great. Who's going to take those two? Great, thank you. Fourth? Funny. Funny, okay. Two there. Okay, great, good. Smart. Smart. Okay. Great. Persevere. You're, per- you're persistent. Okay. Persistent. Great. Who are going to have to take care of that one? Okay. Great. Beautiful. And beautiful. All of them. See, that's so cool. Okay. Now. So, and I can't see your name tag. So. <laughs> yeah, what is your name? Jody. 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 Okay. Now, so Jody. each of you, so each of you are going to say seven times, Jody, it really is true that you are, and then you're going to say the thing you you were given to say that you volunteer for that you're smart or beautiful or whatever. So Jody. Jody. Okay. Oh, Dolly, got it. Thank you. See, I made a mistake. I'm probably no good. Okay, now. <laughs> see, it's funny. If you see your mistakes and start making fun of them, it just gives you a different lightness about that, right? Okay, so you're going to say the name. You're going to say, it really is true that you are. And then you're going to say the thing you were given or you volunteered for. And we're going to say it seven times. And I'll say it together. Ready? Go. Jody, 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 it really is true Jody, that you are. Jody, 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 it really is true that you are. Keep on. It really is true that you are. It really is true that you are. It really is true that you are kind and loving. It really is true that you are kind and loving. One more time. It really is true that you are kind and loving and giving. All right. Read your list to us again powerfully. I am, and just say the seven things. I am kind. I love others. I am compassionate. I am a perseverer. I love helping others. I am funny. I am. Smart and beautiful. And we all say yeah. that's true. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Do they feel different the second time? We have to consciously claim what's true about us. Now, when we come back, and we're going to acknowledge our mistakes in a way I think will be really fun and interesting for you. So it'll give you a whole different way of thinking about acknowledging your mistakes, which I'm thinking will be useful to you. Now, but I'm going to do a little break time here for us. And I want you to remember there are these two tag books, so I want you to talk about each one just for a second. Um, the first book I wrote about the game of tag, I wrote almost as a counselor. So a couple comes in, I write this story about what happened in each session, what they learn, how they apply it. And at the end of each chapter, you get a place where you get to apply those to your own life and think about So you get to kind of work through that process with the people in the book. And some people really like that. They like the story. They like that it's grounded and that it's real. And it's just like going to see a counselor. And then at the end, the counselor has them go to a seminar. That's a funny thing, isn't it? All right, now. And some people came to me and actually asked, because Gwen helped me with the other book, said, hey, this is good. We love it. Good material. But could you just sort of boil it down? Could you just give us like a bullet point Here's how the game looks. Here's the impact it has. Here's how to break out of that so you can create the life you really want once your brain gets straight, like we're working on today. And so I, Gwen and I did write that book. So this book is a story. It's specifically about a couple, and some people like that better. This one is more of a bullet point thing, and it's for all relationships. And so remember, they're 15 bucks a piece, or you can get three for 30 because we really want you to give one away. Um, okay. Where did Kathy go? She always leaves me just when I need her. Life is, life is hard. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, so I'm joking. Just say that sentence to yourself. Just close your eyes and say that sentence to yourself. Life is really hard. What happens on the inside? Just saying that sentence, even if you're being silly about it, it still feels bad, doesn't it? And then what happens to the energy in your body? That think, feel, do thing is absolutely instantaneous. We need to understand. If I want to change my life, I've got to change my thinking, because what I tell myself is a lot of what, what happens. All right, so let's take a break. Get some books if you want. Talk to the people at Prayer Ventures about what they do, because they have this powerful ministry that I'm so proud to be a part of. Come back. Let's take 10. We'll come back at like, uh, let's make it 12. Just go to like even numbers. We'll come back at 1035.